Welcome back to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tom Spender. The UK is the online dating capital of Europe, according to a new survey. More than 9 million Brits are logging on in the hope of finding partners. It's an industry that last year generated £170 million for the British economy. Such is the demand that Britain has produced 1,500 of Europe's 5,000 dating websites. And about 30% of new relationships are thought to begin online. So what's going on here? Are British people perhaps much worse at flirting than other Europeans? Or is online dating simply a more efficient way to find your dream partner? With me in the studio to discuss this are Liz Hoggard, a features writer at the Evening Standard and co-author of Dangerous Women, The Guide to Modern Life, and Liz, uh, excuse me, Liz Hodgkinson, an author and a journalist. On the phone, we have Henning Wiechers, chief executive of Metaflake, which reviews online dating agencies, and Graham Jones, a web psychologist. So why is the UK Europe's online dating hub? Henning Wiechel, uh, your company Metaflake compiled the research. Perhaps you could start us off. Yeah, um, I think the, the, the most important reason is that the UK has the longest uh, tradition of online dating in, in Europe. It, it came over from, from the United States about uh, in, the, in the year 2000, more or less. And uh, they started earlier, so they are more used to it and uh, they, are, they are a bit more willing to pay for it. Um, so that's the main reason. It's not about the culture too much. Liz Hoggard, what do you think? Well, by default, I've become a, an apologist for internet dating, I think, because it gets such a bad press. And I suppose what I'd argue that it, I think it's a really good thing. I think we don't have the same things we had 10 years ago. You know, we don't have people having dinner parties and office parties in the same way. I think it's really hard for people to meet, you know, each other. And I noticed even my 20-something colleagues have all got these whizzy dating smart apps on their phones. So I think, in general, choice is just really good for people and especially for women. But um, I think it takes quite a long time. I think it's like applying for jobs. I don't think it, it's, it comes immediately. But, yeah, I find it quite heartening and I hope other people who've, who've done the same thing are sort of rather encouraged to find that they're part of a new statistic. Liz Hodgkinson. I think online dating is something that ought to work. But, and I've got friends who have met partners online, but as far as I'm concerned, I have never met anybody or read a profile that has got the level of intelligence I'm looking for, let alone any other qualities. Graham Jones, uh, wh why do you think Britain is the, uh, Europe's uh, online dating hub? I think it's absolutely true that, that the reason is that we started it earlier than other European countries. So they're, they're just kind of catching up with us, really. Um, but the, the popularity of online dating is, you know, undeniable uh, throughout Europe. Um, and they're just, we're just slightly ahead of the game, that's all. British people have this reputation of being reserved, uh, n not finding it easy to kind of make contact with, with strangers. This isn't really something that has any effect on our dating culture, Liz Hoggard. I think it does, because I think alongside doing internet dating, you know, you're still going on blind dates or going to parties in the hope of meeting people. But I think what it does is it opens up your, your potential. And I think the worst thing you can do is obsess about somebody who broke your heart and, you know, sob in your bedroom for 10 years and assume that no one's ever going to match that again. That's a really quite depressing and quite hard thing for us to accept. And I think, you know, with internet dating, you could be going for cups of coffee with five people by the end of the week. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily advocate doing that. I, I could never cope more than about two people in my head at any one time. But yeah, you will meet a lot of, of a lot of well, kiss a lot of frogs before you actually meet somebody nice. And I think that's that's part of life. I think the one advantage you've got is you know the other person is single, and you know that they um, are potentially interested in getting to know new people. I think you should be up for hiring new friends as well as looking for a significant other. I think if you're too narrow and too prescriptive, then you're going to alienate people. And I, I do worry about those profiles that say you must be and generally sort of advocating what weight women should be or how exciting you should be as a person. You know, why would you accept that in any other bit of your life? But I think it's really nice when people tell you a bit about themselves, like, you know, what's not to be interested in. Liz Hodgkinson, uh, you know, you have to work hard, you have to push through, you can't find your dream match immediately, but uh, you're still not convinced. 
they sound all right. But then, um, as Liz said, uh, uh, they're all single. Well, actually, they're not. A lot of them are not single. They're put because the thing is, they're hiding behind anonymity. They can say what they like about themselves. When you meet them, you find that they're often nothing like what you expected and that's what I'm finding but of course it's it, it is difficult with older people it's, it is yes it's true it's difficult to meet people but the older you get I mean I'm very healthy for my age but most men of my age are on buckets of pills they've got heart problems they've got gammy legs I mean these are the kind of people who and they've got baggage you know they haven't got any money they've got small children even though they're in their 60s so I'm not I'm not saying it can't happen but I think probably I'm looking. I'm, I'm looking for. Yeah, I'm looking for a stately home, really, and not an ex-council flat. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, good luck with that. Uh, Graham Jones, uh, do are people dishonest online? Does it provide a, a kind of shield of anonymity by which, uh, behind which, people can kind of be what they would like to be rather than what they are? This is really interesting, actually, because all of the research about whether we tell lies online or are truthful online fall into two camps. And one camp shows us that actually, in general, we are more honest online than we are in the real world. So all of the stuff we do online, we tend to be much more honest about it, except men in online dating sites. And men in online dating sites, about 20% of them, tend to be a little bit of a fibber. They tend to exaggerate themselves much more, uh, often saying they're much thinner than they really are, uh, often saying that they, you know, they earn more money than they do, and all these kind of things that exaggerate their, their kind of peacock status. To, I, I, to I can and... confirm that because I um, contacted, or, or um, a man, this is some years ago now, contacted me, and he sounded, on his profile, he sounded... Um, you know, as if as if he might be a, a possibility, and he said to me that he was in the top two percent of earners in the country, and I thought it's not that I'm looking for money because you know I'm okay. I, I don't need somebody to support me. I'm looking for somebody to match me. But when I actually met him, he was on the dole. Oh dear! <laughs> well, what a disappointment. But Graham Jones, do these men who are ultimately lying about themselves are they actually more successful? Um, no, they're not more successful. The, the problem is that they, they think they're only exaggerating in the way that they might face-to-face -face with someone. So if, they, if they're at a, you know, a party and they meet someone who they're interested in, they're, they're going to try and say that you know, they are a, a good person and that they're nice and easy to get on with. But what happens in that face-to-face -face interaction is something that doesn't happen when they're completing their profile online. What happens face to face when you meet a potential new partner is that you are immediately getting feedback about what you're saying. You're getting nonverbal feedback. You're getting microfacial gestures which tell you whether or not you're going in the right direction, body language, distance between each other, all these kind of things we subconsciously absorb when we're telling our story about who we are. And that keeps us in check from exaggerating too much. When we complete our profile online, we don't get any of that feedback. So all this desire to um, impress somebody just comes out with there's no control over it when, when men complete their profiles online. And that's the problem. They tend to over-exaggerate because there isn't that immediate feedback that they would get in the real world. Henning Wiechel, uh, men are exaggerating. Uh, the online uh, environment is... It's difficult to, to, to figure out who a person really is uh, just by reading their profile. Uh, it, I mean, frankly, online dating, it, it, there are a lot of kind of challenges uh, involved in it that, that simply don't exist offline. Uh, I mean, why is it working or is it working? Well, yeah, it's working definitely. Um, and uh, we see how many, uh, how many money people spend for it, how, how many uh, partnerships start online. Um, there are a lot of surveys, and, and they prove it. And I think the, the most important fact is that, you know, today we have a second marriage market, which starts in the 30s or in the 40s. When you get divorced, when you suddenly wake up and you, you see that you worked for 20 years and you forgot to, to found a family or stuff like that, um, that kind of market wasn't there like two or three generations earlier. Um, and for this market, um, you need new ways to find your partner. And it's difficult for, for, for let's say, for a single mom living in a little village to, to go out to the nightlife to, to find a new partner. So um, 
this, this, that's just a new way which, which uh, fits to, to the new uh, environment in the society. And uh, there are a lot of disadvantages, right? Um, and we don't really understand why the dating companies don't work on that, you know? This, uh, this step from online to offline, um, in, in like seven of ten uh, blind dates, is a big disappointment because you don't get uh, in the real life what, you, what you've expected when you go to blind date. And uh, people, uh, the companies should work on this topic. They should, for example, um, uh, establish this webcam dating more so um, people can, can get a better impression of, themselves, of, of each other online. And there are, another, there are a lot of other methods um, which psycholog uh, psychologically um, can help uh, to, to make this step smaller from, from online to offline. But uh, the, the companies are very, very slow in doing this, you know, and um, we don't really like it. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tom Spender, and we're discussing online dating. Do we become too picky online? You know, do we reduce the search for a date to a kind of online shopping experience? And, you know, if so, if a potential mate doesn't tick all of our boxes, do, do, do we dismiss them out of hand when, let's say, in a bar or something like that, we might actually go up and talk to them, Liz Hoggard? Well, I think the trouble is I'd never have gone up and talked to anybody, so that's, that's already off my radar. And the idea of web dating just fills me with horror as well. But I'm, I'm sure that's a good idea. If it's a pragmatic thing to have an idea of what the other person looks like if that's really high on your list. I think by the end I just thought I'm going to tell the truth about who I am. Not too much because it can be really boring for other people. And if I have to lie about anything, then frankly I've got lovely friends, I've got a nice life, let's not worry and I think that um, the shopping list mentality is a bad one. What I'd say about internet dating is I think after initial, you know, connections on by email and a little bit of sort of mutual ground, I think you meet really fast because otherwise you spend, I'm, I'm quite early on, you know, I, I'd spend days emailing the other person. They'd send me their taste in films and ideas and books and it was wonderful. And then of course when you meet and you find you've got absolutely nothing in common, it's mortifying because you've both slightly misled each other. I think it is just like being in the sitting room in a party trying to get into the kitchen because that's where the interesting people are. And I think it just gives you a bit of a chance to get into that room. I really don't think it's very different from real life. And I do identify with a lot of what Liz is saying about um, sometimes male sort of the gap between what somebody is and how they're presenting themselves. But, you know, I think we're, we in society are partly responsible for that. They're supposed to be all these things and perhaps we should be a bit more tolerant. I mean, my favourite one was I had um, a jazz musician who, when he turned up, bless, he was a busker and he'd had to earn the money to buy me a drink before he could come and meet me. And if he, he said quite bluntly, if I hadn't earned it, I wouldn't have turned up. <laughs> and I thought that was sort of rather great. I mean, we were completely unsuitable. But, you know, he told me about his life for half an hour. I'm a journalist. I found some great stories out of him. It wasn't a waste. Liz Hodgkinson, uh, you know, in theory, you don't have to choose between online dating and meeting people in, in other ways. Why not just do both? I, had, I do do both. I do do both. Um, and, uh, but I just thought that online dating, as, as Henning was saying, it's, the, it's a new thing. Uh, the advantage it has is that you're all looking for the same thing. You're all looking for a partner. But... All I can say is that um, possibly because of being a Fleet Street journalist, I've all my life I've been around very highly intelligent, very, very witty people. I'm not saying they're all very nice in other ways necessarily or that there's an amazing chemistry between us, but at the very least, they're good company. And at the very least, that's the bottom line of what I'm looking for, somebody who's fun. And I, I'm not finding these fun people online I perhaps, don't know why. Perhaps you could start a, a new <laughs> dating website for journalists. <laughs> Fleet Street Love or something like this. Stick, you see, I want someone with some achievements behind them, not someone who's worked in a local government office all their life and just retired. There's, no, there's nothing that we would ever have in common. You know. Well, listeners, if you're out there, uh, do get in touch. <laughs> Sorry if I sound snobbish, <laughs> but I mean, what's the point? You know, I've I've had I've had two fantastic partners in my life, and you know, who've been very stimulating, very amusing, um, very intelligent, very witty people. They've had their downsides, of course, but I'm not finding those sort of people online. They're either they're not coming, or they're not looking for someone like me, one or the other.
Graham Jones, uh, are there some, you know what are some of the other uh, behavioural tics that uh, people uh, indulge in uh, in online dating that they don't necessarily do in real life? I mean, well, it is this um, lack of um, ability for us to understand them completely. So they, they they need somehow in these sites to kind of have a halfway house between the online stuff and the real world so that we can get to, to know people. So maybe, you know, the first step after uh, agreeing to somebody's profile that you quite like them is not to actually arrange to meet them, but maybe to arrange to have a video connection, video call together with them. Some of the sites will do that, but not all of them. And if that was the first step, you'd get to know a bit more about that person and be able to uh, connect with them. But one of, the, one of the difficulties that I suspect the site owners have is that... There are two kinds of people who use these sites. There's the very sociable person, and that's why they're using these sites, because they're just extending what they would do naturally. They're very sociable. They go out to parties. They go out meeting people, and they also meet people online and check out online dating sites because they're, they're very uh, sociable people. And those people tend to have high levels of self-esteem, which means that they then engage with these people online really well and they get through to the information they need. The problem is that there's a significant slice of the people doing online dating, it appears, who have low self-esteem. And that's why they're not going out, because they're worried about themselves. And that's why they don't really connect as well as they might with the potential partners online. And they end up being disappointed, which then means that they... Um, still don't have a, a potential partner um, and they go back and they try and find someone else and the whole thing uh, deteriorates. They get constantly disappointed. If that disappointment could be taken out because that person with low self-esteem is terribly worried about that first date, if that could be reduced, that problem could be reduced by them having a, an online video chat that might improve the whole situation for everyone. Henning Wiechel, uh, y your research was Europe-wide. Uh, did you actually notice any kind of different trends in emerging in different countries? You know, what are some of the characteristics of online dating in, in other European countries? Well, actually, um, online dating uh, is, is nearly the same in, in, in all countries. Um, uh, there are several um, waves or, or phases when, when online dating comes to a new, new country, and all those, uh, those phases, uh, they, 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 they take place in the same order. At first, it's the gay people that are entering online dating, then it's men searching for sex, then it's normal singles searching for their partners, then it's women who find out that, that finding sex online is a, is a great opportunity, and at the end of the day, it's, it's the senior citizens who, who join the game. And uh, if you take a look at different European countries, we just see that, that there are, we are on different uh, levels of, uh, of development, um, like in Romania or, or even in Italy, um, they are on, a, on an earlier level. And uh, apart, of, apart from the behavior, um, we see big differences in spending money for online dating, but this is very close connected to the, to the wealth of the, the countries themselves. Like we saw that Spanish or uh, people from, from Italy they're just not able to pay that much for online dating right now. And uh, you were talking about uh, suggesting webcam uh, meetings, and both you and uh, Graham Jones have suggested this, in fact. But Liz Hoggard is saying that she views that with dread. Well, I sort of worry that we are objectifying too much about what the other person looks like. And I mean, I think it comes back to the similar point that we've been making about people with social anxiety disorder having difficulty dating. We're talking as if romance is the great mantra that solves every problem in our lives. And I think it's really only one of many things you can do to change when you're not feeling great about yourself or you've got into a bit of a rut or you've lost the person you thought was the love of your life. You know, I think it's rather sort of worrying that we're quite so sentimental about romance because, as we all know, you know, when you do meet the significant other, there are lots of other problems like, you know, can we all survive financially at the moment? Do we have equivalent jobs? Do we like their sister? You know, it's, it's about having a skill set, about connecting with other people. And if you meet someone lovely and fall in love with them, that's a fantastic thing too. So to sort of, I don't know, I think to, to be so sort of convinced about the way that somebody looks, I, I suppose it's being honest. If you feel I only go out with girls with brown hair or who are under five foot six, or then that's probably helpful if you know you're not going to move on that. But the, when I think about the people that, that I care about most in my life, particularly my friends, I can't remember whether they're good looking or not. I assume they are. But... Um, 
the thing that excites me about them is something else. And I think all those other nonverbal cues that you get when you meet somebody, I think that's really important to pick that up. But I, I would say that this idea of an A and a B list, you know, the people who were sparky and fascinating and brilliant in, in one website and the ones who have got sort of difficulties in another, that's not the best way of working. If it, at best, it's to give you a confidence boost. And I do think that this sort of idea that internet dating is somehow, you know, going to provide you the thing that you haven't managed to get in real life, I think all it does is give you more options. And just it's just nice to exchange stories with other people. What I think Liz is completely right about is there is a great hypocrisy about men and internet dating. And I think there's some very fabulous women on those sites. And I think that men, you know, it's not just that they're going for younger women, but they have a bit more time and they have a self-invented notion of themselves. I think women are pretty realistic. And I think there is a gap there. And, and that is something that I think they should look into more. I mean, uh, if I'm right, you met your current partner through, through <laughs> online dating. Uh, just tell us briefly how that, how that happened and how it developed. Well, I was going to say, I wish somebody else would meet somebody, you know, at the, the sort of ripe age of 49, because then I wouldn't have to keep writing about it. Um, no, he's, I mean, he's really nice, but I didn't, you know, he knows all this. I, I wasn't convinced at all. And um, he was very keen. And I think actually he was just good mannered and he'd come out of divorce. And I think therefore he was he was more sort of, you know, enthusiastic about the whole thing. So I was quite firm and I said, we're just going to be friends and um, we would just hang out. And, you know, I was even going to introduce him to some other women that I thought were probably more suitable. But he stayed the course. And then I think I introduced him to a group of my friends. I, I pretty much ignored him. And he handled it so well and they liked him and they all came back the next day and said, they didn't know how we'd met, who was that great man? And I thought, really? So it, I think there's something about that, putting somebody new into your social group, unless you find it mortifying, it allows you to look at them with different eyes. And yeah, it's really funny now, I can't understand why I didn't. But I think I was just so used to people not nice being nice to me on dates that when he was nice, I thought there was something suspect about it. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tom Spender, and we're discussing online dating. With me in the studio are Liz Hoggard, a features writer at The Evening Standard and co-author of Dangerous Women, The Guide to Modern Life, and Liz Hodgkinson, an author and journalist. On the phone, we have Henning Wiechers, chief executive of Metaflake, which reviews online dating agencies, and Graham Jones, a web psychologist. Liz Hodgkinson. You know, you, you have to go on a first impression when, you, when you're online dating. You've got nothing else to go on. And so if, if the first impression is off-putting, I mean, if I'm meeting somebody at an art gallery or at a party, for example, and I haven't been online, uh, a new person, then I'm not really thinking do they look like the sort of person that I'm looking for if I enjoy their company? But, you know, with online dating, appearance sort of seems to become much more important somehow because you don't know them. And how much, what have you got to go on? Nothing, really. You don't even know their names uh, uh, until they reveal them. Graham Jones, do you think that online dating is making us more superficial? Um, I don't, don't think it is. I think the, the problem is that the people who use online dating the most are the people that we know who have most what's called dating anxiety. So these are the people who actually get really worked up about meeting a, another partner. So I think the problem Liz is happening, having with you know, finding the right person is that the, the dating sites have got so many men who are worried about dating that the men who are not worried about it they, they will just go out and, and date people. So it, we've got a subset of the population, as it were, who really use these sites more actively than anybody else because they're most worried about meeting other people. And that's why they don't present themselves properly and why it might seem to be superficial. The, the real issue is these sites would work a lot better if perhaps the sites themselves could help people reduce their dating anxiety. And then uh, the whole uh, thing would be much more real world as opposed to this little microcosm of people who are uh, really worried about meeting other people. Henning Wichel, uh, beyond offering kind of webcam chats, should dating uh, websites start offering uh, dating anxiety seminars and this kind of thing, or would that actually be off-putting to, to customers? They... They try to, but uh, people are not really interested. In it. But to them, it's uh, it's just another way to make money. If they if they try to sell products like that, um, and they they tried in the past, but uh, it was nothing that people really really uh, liked or bought. So they switched this kind of services off again. 
Okay. And uh, overall, I mean, you know, online dating is something that has come to Europe from America and uh, was adopted, let's say, by Britain earlier than other European countries. But do you think that online dating also encourages a kind of American-style dating culture, which is not something that is traditional, let's say, in Europe as a whole? Exactly, exactly. Um, um, like, like we in Germany, we don't even have a word for dating. Um, either you're together with someone or you aren't. But uh, dating as a process of meeting someone who was recommended to you and for a while and you know, know those rules like if you don't kiss at the third date, it's over and stuff like that. Rules like that don't exist in Germany and in, in many uh, other European countries as we have another tradition of, of uh, meeting our partner like uh, in our peer groups, in workplace, uh, sports, wherever. Um, and in the United States, where a lot of immigration took part in the past, um, this dating process, which is a bit artificial, um, um, has a long tradition. And so it was much easier in the United States to, to, um, to adopt this online dating uh, in the society. So you're saying that because the U.S. is more diverse and people had less of an idea of different people's cultural backgrounds, uh, this kind of pragmatic approach uh, led to dating as a phenomenon? Exactly. Um, yeah, as I said, um, I don't know. I don't know what's your 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 view um, on on this this term of dating in the UK. Um, all I know is that in the United States, uh, dating is a is a very established thing, and is, it has certain rules and stuff like that. And we in Germany, we don't have that. And we learned dating by by uh, learning online dating. And I don't know what's the state here in the UK. OK, um, uh, unfortunately, it's a fascinating subject, but we've kind of run out of time. So I'm going to ask everyone for a, a sort of closing thought on online dating. And perhaps we could look at where it's going, what evolutions we might see in the future. Uh, Liz Hoggard. I'm in awe of the Germans not having a word for dating. I think that's so healthy. Um, I think that, yeah, I think the thing is that we've borrowed a lot of stuff from New York, Sex and the City in lots of ways showed us that there's this whole culture. What we've got to do is be a bit more upfront, like the New Yorkers, and be braver and more truthful. You know, what does exclusive mean? Are you allowed to go on dates with 10 other people? Let's just all be a bit franker about it. It would be helpful. Liz Hodgkinson. When it comes to the over 50s or the over 60s in my case, you're meeting a lot of people who, when you were at university, they'd have been the boys nobody wanted to go out with. Now they're old. <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Graham Jones. I think there's an opportunity for a website called Dating Boys You Didn't Want to Go Out With. Um, but I, th I think what's really important to realise is that we're restricted by the current state of technology. It doesn't match what we deal with in the real world in emotional terms, but there is technology on the horizon currently being tested which allows us to transmit our emotions over the internet. And when that happens, then online dating really will work. Henning Wiechers. I think online dating is just a new platform. And... Uh, all the problems people have, they, they come from the people themselves, people who are, have difficulties to find a partner for many, many reasons, and uh, online dating can't fulfill miracles here. That rounds it up. Uh, with me in the studio were uh, Liz Hoggard, a uh, features writer at the Evening Standard and co-author of Dangerous Women, The Guide to Modern Life, and Liz Hodgkinson, author and journalist. And on the phone we had Henning Wiechers, chief executive of Metaflake, which reviews online dating agencies, and Graham Jones, a web psychologist. Thank you all very much. Thank you.